search engine if you are searching by keyword and that then you are trying to see whether through the use of in index whether that keyword occurs in a file and then just finding the sim that is the simplest index and simplest search engine but just finding all the documents where the keyword appears is not very useful often so you go with the statistics how often so those keywords occur and where do the keywords occur so the moment for example you say in a search engine that this keyword there are two document documents where in one document the keyword appears in the body of the document that the query term and in another one the keyword appears in the title arguably the latter is a better match right where the search appears so in very early days when um, <coughs> the basic search engines were built um, they were all about keywords appearing or what what counts and so on and so forth then people started to make use of such information as the structure of the document where does the keyword appear does it appear in the title does is it the name of the author of the file is it in the first paragraph of the um, uh, document is it in the is it, is that word or term in uh, uh, marked as bold right? if the term is in the heading then maybe it's more interesting or more important than if the same term is in the uh, text uh, in the body so now this information as to where this word appears is called metadata this is just one of the many many types of metadata you can talk about is data about data the keyword or the query term is data and the fact that it appears in the title or h1 part of the um, uh, document or in href you know as the you know the name of the link text of the link then that can be called as metadata data about data right so what you see here is that this metadata where does the term appear is just one example is very crucial to building many applications including search engines if that um, um, uh, suppose you say that i know that this particular resource on the web is a dictionary and then if i say define word then i would give priority to those sources where that word appears and the text also with that not any other document you see what i'm saying again the use of metadata thus use of metadata is very crucial so in the today's class and perhaps in the next class we are going to try and understand this metadata okay metadata is the core cornerstone stone of of you know building a little bit smarter information systems smarter data oriented systems okay so the idea is to look at uh, metadata in this variety now i have um, put here three links just so that you know here is a link of a, a little um, uh, article just to get you started um, on uh, that that has i written for non technical or industry or business audience semantic metadata for enterprise information integration this was not necessarily written even for the uh, with, with specifically the web in mind okay so that's something you may want to look at the next one is this document um, this one portrays the evolution of information systems from pre web to all the way uh, to kind of early uh, well i think um uh, to to because this appeared in 2000 kind of in 1990s okay but nevertheless it gives you a feel of how the things have 
had matured. So it gives you in one um, single article or chapter a fairly good um, uh, historical overview of um, uh, information systems as they were. And then there is yet another um, you know, book chapter uh, overview on using metadata to manage multimedia data. So this particular chapter is not limited to text. You know, majority of what we are doing in this course uh, focuses on text. However, there, is, there are media of all different kinds on the web. And there are unique type of metadata that are involved in that. For example, if you talk about images, then you have uh, 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 pixel related information as in metadata, or image <coughs> size as in metadata, which will obviously not apply to a textual document. They would have different parameters. So, to try and get a sense of that is also what is given here. So let me now start with the presentation part of it. Feel free to ask questions. So we will talk about what is metadata, uh, some description and standards. <coughs> A uh, little bit about storage, exchange, infrastructure, then, will, then, the, then some um, insights into creating metadata automatically, uh, and then uh, you know, some example of applications of this metadata. This is a rather broad um, uh, you know, uh, overview of metadata, and there is, you know, it can we can spend clearly many, many uh, days uh, to discuss about, to discuss uh, metadata. So, a simplest definition is um, that metadata is data about data. Okay. And um, obviously, this can be also recursive. So, data about data is data itself. So, metadata is also a data, which is, you know, people can use it recursively. Um, and there are many applications of metadata. In fact, we'll be more interested in the applications involving web-based information systems or applications. But content management, uh, and even, for example, content management uh, for the web, when you're building a website and you have a content management system, again, they would use metadata. Library catalog, do it a similar system. That's a form of metadata. Input retrieval and search, and many, many other things. So, uh, this is a good statement that um, somebody made a web content repository without metadata is like a library without an index. It so gives you an idea of the importance of the metadata. Now, if you look at, there are four very interesting terms, uh, four four terms that we should kind of uh, get a hang on um, and on when you build information systems. One is the systems aspect of it, meaning typically hardware, operating system, all of those kind of basic things, infrastructure. Then, with regards to any information or data, you have a syntax of that associated with that, you have structure associated with that, and then you have semantic associated with that. Right? Uh, so there are um, you can talk about synthetic metadata, you can talk about metadata about structural aspect, and you can talk about metadata about semantic aspect. So if I tell you that this document has 1034 words, that is a metadata about this document, but this is syntactical. Suppose I say that the document title has this word, because now title it refers to structure, how the data is organized, or you have you talk about Wikipedia info box, if that if you are aware of that, then you are talking about structure, and in the metadata that is aligned with, that that is associated with the structure of the information, how the information is organized in XML DTD is a structural element, right? So then you are talking about a structure no, metadata, and then you have semantic metadata, one that gives you some meaning of the data, right? some interpretation, some understanding. 
these distinctions are not always very simple, but uh, it's something that I think you should know very well. So here is a pyramid. It shows you starting with data to high level of abstraction, how you go up in the information value chain. You can see, for example, data, and you can talk about type of the data. This, there are these three terms used, and I'll uh, you know expect that you will understand these terms very well. For example, these are the kind of things I may ask you about in the midterm, as an example. So, at a very broad level, you can talk about data that are in terms of you know, unstructured data, that are semi-structured data, and that are structured data. Example of unstructured data is. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, a document with just text in it, right? Or a poem, or you know, uh, <coughs> the body of a text of, of an article. Example of the semi-structured data, where there are some part of the data which have some structure, and then there is a lot of body of the data which is a lot of unstructured data, right? So typically. XML documents are semi-structured documents. It's considered to be an example of semi-structured data where there will be some pieces of it which would have large body of text. <coughs> Not necessarily, but often. And you will have all these tags. And the tag value, tag value, those that is the structural part of it. So there will be a mix of structure and unstructured data. And there will be structured data, which is typically a database. If you have all the fields neatly laid down in a, in a table, then that is structured data, right? Where every element, you can get to every element di directly. You have typically a query uh, interface infrastructure for the structured data, right? Uh, Semi-structured data may also have it typically exploiting the uh, structured, part, structured part of that document, right? So you may be doing passing of XML document, exploiting the structure there. And then you will be doing grep on something that is where you are doing something with the unstructured part of it, right? <coughs> the other distinction possible also you can say data that is multimedia data, right? So you can talk about different, uh, you know, types of media, images, audio, video, and so on and so forth. So you can talk about that and you can have so called multimodal data, right? So where data of different modality, again, you know, picture is an example of modality or media, either way. Now, first line of, kind of first simple type of metadata are the syntactic metadata. So you can say, well, this document is in this language. It doesn't say anything about what document says, but it says document is in the language. Then it uses this format of storage. That it uses, um, uh, you know, this, this length of the document. Again, it doesn't say anything about document itself, what does it say, what does it convey to human, let's say. But says uh, you know it gives you something about the document that it has a following creation date. So these are some examples of syntactic metadata. If it's uh, let's say video streaming video data uh, or, or or streaming audio data, you can say audio bitrate of the data. There's an encryption of that. So and so forth. These are all examples of syntactic metadata. Right? Then comes structural metadata. So one that may, for example, uh, you know. Uh, you know, talk about structured document as in DTDs or XSL. You also talk about structure in the sense of organizing the, um, um, uh, you know, document and um, bring all certain words through the use of, st let's say, statistics or other methods together and create a cluster. So they are kind of related in some way. So something, you know, uh, they, for example, you can depict them saying these are the words that are close by in the structure and these are the words that are farther off. Well, you, what you are showing there is a cluster. If So far as you are not going within the cluster and what does the cluster convey, then, you know, if you are not doing that, then it is structured metadata. The meaning it may convey becomes semantics. Right? And then you may talk about semantic metadata because this is an image. And in that image, this is abdomen, and you know uh, this is organ of you know a region of upper abdomen and uh, uh, you know organ of liver. <coughs> or you can say that 
this particular document gives you a negative commentary on this particular political candidate right you are giving interpretation of it you are uh, you know um, uh, for example um, if a uh, um, you know and, and in fact you might have to uh, sometimes the distinctions are a little bit harder um, you are using your knowledge to tag a document right suppose there is a document or an image or whatever you're tagging it that tag would you the fact that the tag exists and you are simply matching the words would be simply some syntactic aspect the fact that it conveys beautiful flower maybe that becomes semantics okay so there is certain distinction there is some you know you have to kind of often think about it you can't give a totally uh, you know mathematical definition of what is syntax what is uh, semantics okay but one that conveys meaning improves um, understanding of something at a human level that is certainly semantic at the top i listed there um, ontology this is mostly a sort of bunch of reference terms and once where people have come together uh, where people have agreed upon its common interpretation and it may have been documented in a language that even machines can exploit the common agreement the agreement among the humans right so your particular vocabulary and that vocabulary is accepted throughout the uh, discipline then you can uh, talk about um, uh, you know uh, ontology uh, and also other thing is that typically it conveys a sense of agreement community wide agreement user uh, uh, agreement among user community and that becomes uh, you know ontology and people have shared understanding of it and so they put it on the top often you use the ontology to improve what is called as information extraction to find things from the document or from any media or any any object and 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 that you know to make those things meaningful because you may be doing with regards to common vocabulary common taxonomy and so on and so forth uh, it improves on the um, uh, quality of uh, metadata that you are creating the for the digital media uh, you know, particularly related to multimedia uh, objects you can talk about uh, what classification as media type specific metadata for example texture of an image or font size you can talk about media processing specific metadata for example something that is used for search retrieval filtering you can talk about content specific metadata saying oh these are all rocket related video and document so uh, you know somebody has determined that there is a rocket or what is you know in, in that video uh, and 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 you know it may be through image processing or it may be through human interaction right and that is what you know is, so so it says what is within the content and so it is content specific metadata so that's just one of the classification so there are many many classifications that exist uh, for describing metadata one of the uh, sort of branded of uh, schemes to uh, describe metadata is so called dublin core metadata initiative this is very widely used uh, uh, metadata um, standard you might call uh, whereby um, it was primarily uh, developed by people interested in library science so it will be um, you know uh, talking about um, just the same way you may have metadata about books in the library similarly uh, things of that nature are adapted uh, you know for use and this there is a, a web space or uh, is, you know web uh, so you, you for example take can take uh, metadata um, and dc here for example stands for dublin core so dublin core has several uh, something like 12 14 um uh, kind of required uh, elements and a whole bunch of um uh, uh, optional and even extensive ex extensible uh, tags okay so or properties so that a, a in object that you're describing has a title that the title, the object was created by somebody or is owned by somebody that there is a subject for that object right subject in the sense of uh, description descriptive subject what you know like a title so that is a, you know and so this is an example and a very well example of a 
metadata uh, description format or standard. Now, uh, there is a book I have. Uh, uh, I had edited a book uh, called Metadata for Digital Media, and we had chapters from num number of uh, well-known uh, people in the field, uh, and <coughs> they had discussed essentially metadata for variety of type of data. You can see in the middle column, images, video, audio, text, multimedia, uh, you know, and different types of text and so on and so forth. And there are there is a, um, a classification that is used on the right hand side called domain specific, domain independent, and I'll come to that shortly. Okay, I say this is one of the classifications for metadata, again, kind of metadata that, that you're using. Now, people may use different models or ways to describe metadata. For geographical information systems, for example, there are two metadata models. One is FGDC, Federal Geographic Data Committee, or something like that. This is a US based, uh, US government organization. They have a metadata standard. They will say that geographical objects will be described using this metadata, right? So what, what, what you are seeing here is that some of the metadata standards are so-called domain specific. People talk about metadata standard for describing water and water resources. People have metadata describing geographical information system. People have metadata describing movies. People have metadata describing entertainment artists, right? So there are all these variety of domains, travel, these, these are called, you know, these are the domains, these are the areas of, of, of human, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of interest to humans. Now, Europe, for example, also has a metadata for describing the same thing. So there is a point here in the world, and both of them, there are two different metadata formats, and you can see that they slightly vary. When that happens, just like you have to deal with the documents, you have to create mappings. You can say, oh, that is how it is described here. I can map it to this other description. Right? Here is um, uh, one view of metadata. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, here you can see the sub metadata that are domain independent uh, or infrastructure oriented. So you can use, you can call RDF as a um, a framework for describing uh, semantic data and or uh, metadata, right? So when I say that here is a an abstract of a uh, a medical uh, you know publication, scientific publication in medicine, then within the abstract there is a um, uh, uh, there is a um, sentence, and that sentence has some entity and property, you know, object, property, subject, right? So, um, uh, you know, uh, you, you have people, for example, or you have basically entities and relationships saying that um, COX-2 inhibitor has been demonstrated to cause heart disease. So COX-2 inhibitor is, in, uh, sub, is a subject, uh, causes is a predicate and heart uh, disease is an object. So that is a, this is called information extraction from that, and you represent that, right? You could represent that in RDF. What I just said, subject, predicate, object, is a RDF, uh, you know, format, uh, you know, a way of saying things, a statement in RDF, right? That, that's how you say uh, something in RDF. But you can use that to describe medical abstract, you can use that to describe any, anything in the world. So it is domain independent. And it's a W3C standard, Worldwide Consortium standard, right? There are some metadata standards that are specific uh, to uh, the type of objects you deal with. For example, MPEG for video. There is a series of standards, MPEG 2, MPEG 4, MPEG 7, MPEG 21, right? So this is, there's a committee and you know, whole number of organizations in the world that uh, debate what should be in a standard. Or for uh, voice related things, there's something called XML when you deliver voice or XML 
uh, subs of in XML format or related format. Then there are some uh, 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 standards which very much deal with a particular domain. So we just mentioned FGDC or UDK. That's for geographical information, uh, you know, information geographical data. So if you're talking about news, uh, then the standard, there is a standard called news. ML. For example, uh, when you see news on variety of, let's say, news portal and Yahoo News or Google News or any of the things. All those things are marked up. Uh, they, they get from content syndicator, uh, news syndicators, or new, first they are news producers. For example, AP News, right? Uh, or Press Trust of India, or or Reuters. So these are news. You know, they, they have um, uh, their own uh, journalists who go to various places and say, AP News. I don't know what is the current number, but at one point of time. There are 3,000 journalists all over the world, and they would actually go to different places, create the, um, uh, you know, story. That story would be packaged in a format by AP News in this news ML format. So it will have a particular set of tags, right? That are very specific. Just like this, so it is more advanced version of Dublin Core kind of thing but uh, has tags that are very meaningful and specific to news uh, you know, uh, delivery syndication industry. And then those news will be uh, used by, let's say, newspaper. They will give a credit or say, you know, say this is credit to CNA, uh, AP. Right? They, will, they will say that. Or they go on, say, Google News or nowadays or Yahoo News or MSNBC. Right? That they flow on the web in this news ML format. And so because of the tagging, it is easier for um, a software to pick up, let's say, title of that news story. And, the, and this, somebody says, I can only have uh, 10 words, uh, you know, long title. Other says, I, I have a column that is even uh, narrower, I can only put six words of the title, right? So they will be able to apply what they need to do and uh, put that um, uh, you know, title, uh, take the title out from the full title that they may have. And there are uh, standards that are very specific to particular application. For example, uh, the application of news syndication, meaning people pay all, you know, have to have a lot of cost of creating news, then they have to make money, right? They have to pay bills. So they syndicate, meaning they aggregate, there, there are people who source, like AP, then they aggregate us, they get content from many such people, you know, uh, organizations that create the content and then there are uh, so they syndicate and then there are consumers or portals they subscribe to it they pay for it they do revenue sharing for example the they um, you know why would somebody uh, allow google to uh, you know uh, display their stories well the idea is that google gives you snippet but when you click on the story you go to the web page of that particular uh, site and that web page makes money, that site makes money by advertisement on that site. And that money is shared, or, or is something that they would have, they make, other, if the consumer did not come from via Google or something to them, they would have less page views. That means they will have less advertisement impressions, that means they will make less money, right? So this is the reason why, uh, you know, this syndication uh, thing works and, and one of the but anyway, um, there, how do you, for example, uh, describe the rights? Who owns the right of this content? How much of that content can be displayed? For example, you may, uh, you know, uh, display the um, low fidelity images, but not high fidelity images. So you try to print that image, you won't make money. You will have to, uh, so you won't be good enough. So you have to actually uh, ultimately go to the uh, web page uh, or you know to, uh, where the uh, they uh, of the site that owns that rights to the image pay them the money get the full digital version of that then only it will be useful and then also then only you'll be using legally right so uh, all that rights and all those things are described in the standard uh, called ice for syndication for content information syndication right or content syndication so these are the this is kind of a, a land of variety of metadata standard. Now, uh, when you talk about content, you know, you content meaning somebody, you know, uh, then there is a, you can talk about a, a life cycle of the content. Let's look at that life cycle of content. Actually, 
I, I borrowed this image. This image I draw. I had drawn in uh, year 1999 when I had started a company. Uh, the comp my company's name was Thali. So, but I think still very useful to learn. Uh, you know, so your content of all kinds. In, you know, we are talking about content in those days of broadcast media content, wireline and wireless content. So these are different delivery making channels. But then somebody uh, produces the content, and then you ask the questions. Where is the content? Whose content it is? Then you can catalog the in-text content. What is this content about? You can ask the question. Then you can integrate or syndicate content. What other content is it related to? Right? You may have links. You may have embedded a stock photograph from something else. You have your, you have a, 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 you know story. And then you photograph of somebody mentioning the story. That photograph may not be taken just for the story itself. It may exist somewhere else. There's a stock photo, right? So called. And well, you may have to talk about that. And then you say you may personalize it. Because uh, I'm only interested in news of this, this, this. I'm not a sports fan. So I don't see, like to see, you know, I, I, you know, I don't have a particular sports section in my uh, personalized page, for example. Uh, most of you would have it. So, uh, you know, what, what are you interested in and you personalize it and there you use metadata, right? You can say, uh, for example, that um, on, on Google News, say, uh, I am interested in uh, entertainment uh, in general, which will often have a lot of uh, Hollywood content, but you can say, I am also interested in um, uh, content from, let's say, Bollywood, or I am interested in content uh, from uh, Italian cinema. Right. Uh, for, you know, so there is, you know, so you 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 will say entertainment Italian, you know, Italian entertainment, and you will be able to see content coming from that. And then you will also do interactive marketing. You will do advertisement. What, for example, it will be good to know what are you displaying to uh, then choose the advertisement accordingly. Very often, uh, what happens? Uh, there is Google AdSense as an example. So when a particular page is being uh, rendered on the fly an API call is made with the keywords associated with that page to the ad server and the ad server picks the uh, advertisement that are relevant to that keyword and delivers it. <coughs> now the, the keywords are essentially metadata of the document that is being rendered, primary document. Using that you are creating, uh, finding other data. Right? And you are displaying that. So now you see, for example, and in all of this uh, whole uh, you know, uh, pipeline, you will see uh, use of metadata of variety of kind. So it's a pretty uh, you know, interesting and deep topic. Here are some uh, uh, standards uh, I already uh, talked about um, a whole bunch of them before. Right? So you can see uh, about the same sort of things. So, RDF, what can RDF do? RDF, because some of you are interested in semantic web and would be working on semantic web, is designed to impose structural constraints on syntax to support consistent encoding, exchange, and processing of metadata. That's what RDF does. Now, what happens is that you see that there is World Wide Web, there are enterprise repositories, internets, and so on and so forth. And you have all kinds of you know content. You have uh, web pages. You have dynamically driven web pages from databases. You have videos and images and all kinds of stuff, right? So the idea is that you uh, and then sometimes some of the content um, you can you know do a uh, you know get query or post query. Uh, you can actually actively get it. Some of the content is being pushed to you, piped to you. Right? So there will be push pull of how do you get content on the web. Right? I hope you guys have thought about how do you, you know, uh, write something where uh, content is being sent to you from a server page versus content is something you explicitly do when through because of user action. Right? So when you think about those things. Um, now, in any case, you have content of various kind and then you write um, uh, crawlers. A crawler is there to to get you a particular content. But then when you process that content, not just getting it, and typically what happens in the search engines is you crawl and then you do index. 
the indexing is in other simpler, simpler form of metadata extraction, right? When you do a more richer <coughs> form of, uh, uh, you know, an analysis of text, it is called information extraction. And that, you know, so one of the most important thing there is called NER, name entity recognition, right? Another is relationship extraction. Those kind of activities done by this piece of software called extractors. And they are typically customized to deal with particular type of digital media or content, particular source, particular domain, and so on and so forth. And then you get metadata. One of the beautiful things would be that you can say this metadata could say that the metadata is about, let's say, um, uh, uh, Tiger Woods. And you may have an image of him, you may have, um, uh, you know, um, clip of an audio about a game he has played in, you may have a news story about uh, his, uh, you know, play in Riders Club, whatever, right? But here you can, by talking about, uh, you know, a golf player, let's say, you may be able to talk about content of variety of kind, right? So this metadata gives you the level of abstraction uh, so that you don't have to worry about the physical uh, manifestations of the content very often. Well, you are in interesting information, but very often you are willing to get your information by looking at a photograph, by reading a story, by listening to a uh, podcast or whatever, right? And thereby again metadata plays a very important role because I can have metadata that um, is not limited to specific media type or it may be. So I may have media specific metadata, I have media independent metadata, right? Now, how do you do extraction? How do you take, um, uh, you know, uh, a web page, uh, some form of digital document and uh, uh, get things of, the nuggets of information you want, extract, and as I said, the most basic thing or most fundamental thing you do is entity extraction, uh, then you may do key phrase extraction, there are many, you know, there are a variety of richer forms that you can do. And uh, so, so you start with, um, Techniques uh, from variety of fields in computer science, statistical methods or cluster analysis is a well-known method, uh, learning uh, methods, uh, machine learning methods uh, is very popular, uh, and collaborative filtering method like what Amazon would primarily do, reference data or concept terms, so you have actually background knowledge. These are all the terms that are used in MESH. MESH is a uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, control vocabulary used for biomedical literature, right? And then you say, oh, if that anything that appears with, regard, with respect to that MASH term, I will tag that document with that term. Now that is a lot more meaningful because you have control vocabulary and what those terms mean in the MASH is rather clear to a large set of users. So then you'll be uh, looking for terms in the data that are related to this mesh terms and so you can talk about that you can create custom uh, do, you know ontologies or domain models which are richer and very specific can be very deep you can say that I am talking about a human parasite in a particular life cycle of that parasite uh, that I find a particular expression of a gene <coughs> so you can see there is quite a deep level of description that is being conveyed and that can be modeled in ontology, and then you can say in doc this document it talks about this, right? So you could go very deep kind of stuff, and so you go from very shallow understanding and extraction of concepts to very deep understanding and extraction of concepts. Let us look at um, uh, extracting uh, a text document. Um, now, um, in th this happens to be a document, and the document has some structure. It has some layer layout. Right, so I can exploit the structure, and uh, and I can say that um, the title of the document is what is there in the first line, right? And obviously, I can write a program to actually just get me in the first line. Then I can say the second line is always um, uh, 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 a date, and then I can say I can write a, a regular expression or some, you know grammar to uh, look for a very specific pattern right and from that I pick out what is the day of the week uh, the uh, 
uh, month and the date and the year and things of that nature. Right? Then I have, uh, you know, some subtitle. Then I have, uh, you know, paragraphs. And I say, what happens, what is there in the first part before the colon is, or before colon, or the full stop, or period, is the paragraph heading. You see? And I can again write a regular expression to pick that out, and so on and so forth. I can say always that uh, the second thing always is about a location. It may be known a priori, and I can exploit that, right? So, this shows exploitation of synthetic knowledge about the document to extract metadata. Right? Yes? Um, do these extractors typically, and this might depend on the application too, um, add data that isn't already in the document for metadata, or is that left to a, a follow-on application where this might be used? Both may yeah. have. So, so uh, the, uh, there are, there are very good cases where, uh, so, so there is a large measure of them that don't really do anything. And as you start building more semantic applications, they will often add. To give you an example, and actually the example will come later in the talk also, is that suppose I come across, um, um, you know, um, let's say, Team Bunners League. Then, uh, one thing may be simply that Tim Berners Lee with the capitalization and such <coughs> seems to be a name proper. Second would be to say it is actually a name of a person. Huh? Third would be that, oh, that name of a person is, a, uh, is the uh, director of Worldwide Consortium. Now, Nothing in the document may say that he is director of worldwide consortium. But because my, I have an ontology where uh, I model people in this area, some area, one of the person that I have mentioned there in, in my ontology, this knowledge base of the ontology, is Tim Berners-Lee. And you know, he is a model and say that there is a model says person uh, with a role in an organization. And then there is Tim Berners-Lee, instantiated as Tim Berners-Lee, Director, World Wide Web Consortium. So when I found Tim Berners-Lee, if I go ahead and automatically add the metadata, then I may be doing information enhancement, or you know, enhanced metadata uh, addition, or, you know, that, that may be doing. And that may also be happening. So again, those are options. But what this, uh, what your question brought, brought out is the fact that now, um, uh, what do you call, uh, what kind of metadata it is? And, and you know, so the fact that if I just think about Tim Berners-Lee, see, uh, that this is why answering some of those questions are not going to be easy when I'm in the exam. So, so it will depend on your interpretation and you'll have to explain to me what your interpretation is. Take an example of Tim Berners-Lee. <coughs> or if all you did was to think of it as a, looking for a, uh, a, a proper noun, then it is not a semantic um, uh, metadata yet. But if you start saying it is the name of a person, it has become semantic now. And then if you know it is not only a person, but it has all these things, it is deeply semantic. Right? So, in the metadata extraction process, you, what may have been a syntactic cue, capitalization is a syntactic cue. So what you typically, so suppose I write you know, a rule that looks for capitalized text, then that is a syntactic metadata extraction just by itself. But that syntactic metadata extraction could potentially be converted to semantic metadata by using that ontology or knowledge base, the additional knowledge I have. That oh this happens to be name of you know this thing it matches with what is described as a, you know all the names of, I go through all the names of persons and there is one person named by that has the same name or that that, that string matches that you know name of person it must be that well maybe or maybe not right but I may need to do more processing to be sure or I can take a leap of faith whatever it is 
But the moment I make an assertion, a claim that this Tim Berners Lee is not just simply capital, you know, two capitalized words, with a second with the hyphen in the middle, but actually a name of a person, I may uh, transition from syntactic to semantic. Right? Now, in this particular case, for example, I say that, oh, S I M E L S. Right? Now, I found that. When I extract that, and I have extracted based on the fact that it is this so called paragraph heading, it is a structural metadata in its origin. But suppose I take the structural metadata and I had a geographical knowledge base where the names of all the towns are there. And I happen to now look it up in that and match it. And then say, yeah, this is the name of a town, I know about it, and this is described here in this knowledge base. That something that was a structural metadata became a semantic metadata. My question to you could be, what is this? Your both answers can be correct. You see them here? If you assume that there was no post-processing with regards to additional knowledge, there is still structural metadata. But if you assume that indeed you could make it a semantic metadata by using additional background knowledge, then it is semantic metadata. More, uh, even more accurate would be to say that its extraction in uh, the, the primary uh, uh, um, extraction process utilized structural features and with use of background knowledge converted into semantic metadata. Do you understand this? Statement. Is that clear? Right? <coughs> Good. Here is a, um, so there was a company called I Syndicate that my company um, used to com com compete with. And so what I Syndicate used to do was to, um, you know, take a bunch of documents that are coming into things like, um, financial news reports, let's say. And then it will automatically classify that. Whether this news report is an earning news or the news report is a, um, a, 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 a merger acquisition, right? these are the variety of things, right? And so you can think of this, let's say, as a, well, this is a taxonomy. Let's assume that this is a taxonomy of financial industry, services industry, right? Then, um, then the, this will have concepts like the ones I just described, right? These nodes would be, um, you know, um, uh, you know, say that this is uh, um, uh, company um, news, and then it will be company news. Uh, here would be a company earning report. It's a type of company news, right? And here would be merger and acquisition. Right? So you have a taxonomy like that, and um, if you have taken machine learning course. What will it, what you would, you know, you, you know what can be done, right? You can say that I go through, uh, say, uh, suppose I have 1,000 documents, I manually go through um, uh, about 100 or 200 of them and tag it, saying that this one is, uh, a tagging would be, this one should be classified here, this one should be classified here, so another one is classified here, the third document should be classified here, and so on and so forth, I do that. This is called my training set, right? And then I give it to my machine learning algorithm or neural network or something along that, that line, right? It does all the kind of processing. It looks at all kinds of strategies in the documents and all that. It then figures out something like, and again, there are many, many, uh, uh, you know, learning mechanisms. Decision tree is one of them. Uh, support vector machine is another one of them, right? So, so, but at a very, very high level, what it would do is to, Say, oh, when such word occurs with such a frequency that a document most likely belongs to this node. If, when this five, this, uh, if five of these words appear, they are most likely here, but some other five words appear, they most, that's most likely here. And, the, and that machine learning algorithm would have accepted strategies for it to make that kind of decision. So once I have done the training, then I give you a new document, not in my training set, and then it will automatically classify with certain level of precision. It won't be 100% right. But uh, people have developed technology so that it goes into 90% plus. Right? 
So uh, uh, most many of Kerala systems earlier used to be in 80 percent, uh, you know, range, uh, and uh, uh, commercial systems, uh, you know, have suddenly gone into 95 percent range. Right. So they be, you know, 19 out of 20, they will be right in there, the model like that. So this is the first level of, um, uh, and in fact, by the way, you can also call this as metadata, saying when I say this article belong, you know, is of this type, that's a metadata. Right? It is content based metadata right? because you have to analyze content. Yeah, but it's not, a, you know, and you, I don't, and you have to ask with this content description, I'll come to that, you know, there's a different classification we have to pass on that. In addition to that, so that is one thing. And what is the value of that? Suppose I do this, what, what do you do with it? What is the value of doing this? <coughs> the value is this. See here, these are all categories. You can think of this as a taxonomy. See here, these are categories. So what it would mean is that a human would not have to categorize document coming in and say it belongs here. My software would do it automatically. That is what it means. Yes. So you're saying you crawl, it's making you crawl the web looking for um, right state alumni, and then you categorize them by what year, and you just automatically put it on your site or whatever category, index it however you want, and then possibly, it all certainly possibly. Although although your may or may not be that easy. The uh, the reason would be that uh, you, if you have a uh, database of uh, you know uh, the roster in, in the classes, then it is easier to validate. If you don't have it, it will be hard because you'll be relying on some uh, <coughs> years if if the document has it, but that may be multiple years, and we don't know exactly if it's a graduation ready year or not. And so there's a lot of complexity of that kind. But yeah, in principle, the point is that kind of thing. Saying all this. Now you may on, you may crawl, or sometimes you have fire fire rows of information. So the uh, uh, you know it, it will be like say um, if I have uh, let's say um, um, about hundred thousand you know ten thousand news uh, stories created in the world today, and I want to make it all kind of automatically put into different bins so that you know people. Yeah, in fact, you need you can you can see that. Um, uh, so, so if you look at any, you know, many, many sites, for example, they would have some uh, taxonomy of their own. You can see this taxonomy here, right? And within that, for example, uh, let's see, in business, there might be sub three. These are these three things. So it's a very shallow taxonomy in this particular case. In some cases, when I go to let's say particular domain specific things, like um, uh, say medical, healthcare, so and so forth, not just general news, then it can become deep. Right? So this is the this is one use of uh, 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 this stuff. But you can become lot smarter. So uh, what Mike, you know, this company did was not only it did you know this classification but it also found out this metadata so some of these metadata are syntactic some came from structure and some of them are semantic and that's something important to understand so here is a speed source this is content independent metadata right because we describe outside in the uh, you know jacket of the you know news ml feed would have a tag source so you just take it out. You didn't have to process the uh, text within the document. Posted date. If you are getting the posted date from looking at inside, then it will be structured metadata. <coughs> but if you are getting it from, um, uh, um, uh, you know, from the tag, then the tag, then you can also call tag as a structure of the document. There also be structure. A very different kind of structure. Here, in one case, you have to 
do the equivalent processing to exploit the structure, which was uh, indirect. Other case, your direct structure is in tag. Please ask question if you don't understand. Okay. Company name. Now uh, there are two possibilities. One is that uh, somebody has manually gone and <coughs> added the information about um, uh, you know the names of the company mentioned. Oh, but in this particular case, uh, we did we went through this and we looked for this. Thing. So we found that there is this entity called France Telecom. You can see it is also capitalized. And then we had an ontology of all the company uh, companies in the world or on the on the stock market. Essentially, that's not very hard. And we matched that, and we found that oh, there is a company. Uh, you know, France Telecom seems like something interesting. Where does it match? It matches with the name of the company. Okay, France Telecom is a company. Well, it's more more difficult than that. But in the, in, a, in a, if I simplify, <coughs> that's what it is. Then um, um, uh, the ticker symbol, F T E and E N T. Now this is very interesting. It's quite possible that F T E and E N T are not mentioned in the document at all. So this is clearly a semantic metadata in this case. Why? Because I had to take France Telecom, and then I had to look up the ontology or knowledge base. To say what is the ticker symbol for France Telecom? I know that stock broker will typically search by the final, you know, stock symbol, not by stock name. So by adding this explicitly, I'll be able to find this document for that person. If I did not have semantic metadata, which uh, did, which added extra metadata, then my search engine would not have found it because the word, you know, the term FTE or ENT does not appear as a separate term. <coughs> but a broker is likely to search by those terms, not by France Telecom. Right? Now the interesting thing is, even today, very few people do this, if at all, on a large scale. Adding extra metadata. Very, very few people do that. Why? Because it takes knowledge base. There is a discussion of this. For example, there is this discussion. Okay, so there was a, for example, and this is not working anymore now, but um, and this is, you can see the date is pretty old by the way. So Peter Norvig, uh, he is a uh, very, very well known guy. Uh, if you have taken AI course, he has one of the best selling AI books. And, um, uh, and uh, he is a director at uh, Google, and he is a big time AI machine learning person. Um, and so he had put in a, a you know, in earlier days of semantic web, uh, he has said semantic web is no good for um, uh, search engines like Google because you can't build ontology or knowledge base for the entire world. And you know, in the Google people search about anything, it's not about you know something very specific. And then uh, that was that's an interesting you know appropriate viewpoint. And then I tell I tell him that that is uh, in my view is that I, uh, that, uh, I disagree with him and I give him my reason. It so happens, it takes a long time, but the <coughs> reasons that I discuss is what you see now happening. After it takes it takes a very long time. But if you look at for example, uh, being better 
then you will see that they have you know all these uh, different areas right and within the areas they have internal model uh, and a corresponding uh, what they call as a entity base entity base is a form of knowledge base or is a form of ontology in a way what it they say is that i know so for example here in the entertainment for the movie they basically know names of all the movies or they suppose and they know all the names of all the music artists and all the song and track names that is a form of ontology right this is what meena and um, uh, you know uh, ibm use in our work we are jointly with them on bbc sound index where we use music brains ontology music brains as an ontology quote unquote ontology not a formal ontology in description logic